Welcome to the second part of Lecture 12 on the topic of plant nutrition. If you have not watched the first part, please stop the lecture now and listen to this before continuing. This lecture is part of the subject Plant Physiology, which is offered as a component of the Bachelor in Agriculture and Technology. This degree is jointly taught by Melbourne Polytechnic and La Trobe University. Please visit our website at www.melbournepolytechnic.edu.au for further information on this course and the other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. This lecture is part of Stage 2. In Stage 1 in this subject, we were learning about plant physiological concepts by taking a virtual tour through the plant. In Stage 2, we will learn in detail about important topics. Plant nutrition is a very important topic in successful managing and growth and development of plants. In this lecture, we are going to concentrate on two components of plant nutrition. The first is nutrient deficiency, and the second is the significance to agriculture of nutrients, plant health and nutrient deficiency. So nitrogen is one of the primary macronutrients which is required in the largest amounts in plants. It's part of many plant components including the proteins and the nucleic acids. In plants deficiency can be seen by corrosis which means the yellowing of the leaves especially in older leaves near the base. This is an image of a healthy vine leaf and this is an image of a nitrogen deficient leaf. Also other characteristics that may be seen, they may have slender and woody stems, they may build up an excess of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates may be used in anthocyanin accumulation and you may see a purple colour. Sulphur is a compound which is found in, found in amino acids such as cysteine, cytosine and methanine. It's consistent of very, a constituent of, very, of several of the coenzymes, particularly coenzyme A, biotin and vitamins. Sulphur deficiency is very similar to nitrogen deficiency. However, the difference in corrosis areas initially in mature and young leaves. This is because sulphur is not easily mobilized, whereas nitrogen is. Phosphate is important to plants as it is a component of the sulfur phosphate intermediates of respiration and photosynthesis. It is also involved in the phospholipids and the nucleotides. What you're looking for when you see phosphorus de uh, deficiency is stunted growth, necrotic spots, sometimes you see excess anthocyanins and that leaves a, a dark greenish purple colour on your leaves. You may see slender but not woody stems. And here we have an image of phosphorus deficiency in wheat. This is the phosphorus deficient plant and this is the healthy plant for your comparison. Silicon is deposited in the ER in cell walls and intracellular spaces. It is used by plants as an alternative to ligonin in strengthening cell walls and has an important functional component for the plant. It can lessen the toxicity of many metals. Many species show enhanced growth, fertility and stress resistance. If silicon is deficient, it is more prone to lodging and falling over and fungal infections. Boron is an interesting micronutrient which plays a role in cell elongation, nucleic acid synthesis, hormone responses, membrane function and cell cycle regulation. When it's deficient, you can see black necrosis of young leaves and terminal buds. You may see stiff brittle stems and loss of apical dominance, thus highly branched. Here is an illustration of clover that has had, that has had boron deficiency. You will notice here that the leaves have gone red in this illustration. As the cation potassium, it has an important role in regulating the osmotic potential of cells. It also activates many of the enzymes in the respiration and photosynthesis. When potassium is deficient, you may see mottled or marginal corrosis. Initially on mature leaves at the base, 
Corn has increased susceptibility to root rotting fungi with potassium deficiency and you may observe increased logging. We have an image of uh, deficient potassium here and an image of uh, the correct amount of potassium. In this slide we're going to look at the effects of calcium and magnesium deficiency. So calcium is used in the calcium 2 plus iron form in it's involved in the synthesis of cell walls and during cell division. It's important second messenger for many plant responses. When calcium is deficient, one can observe necrosis of meristones. Generally, necrosis and downward hooking of the young leaves can be observed. You can get severe stunting. This is an image of a calcium deficient lemon tree. Magnesium, on the other hand, is used in the enzyme activation and is important in chlorophyll. When magnesium is deficient, you can observe chlorosis between the leaf veins, first in the older leaves, then in the younger. You do also see premature leaf abscission, and here we have an image of a, a potato, a tomato plant that's magnesium deficient. Chloride is required for the water splitting reactions in photosynthesis. It's also required in cell division in leaves and roots. When chloride is deficient in plants, you can see wilting of leaf tips, general leaf corrosis and necrosis, and a bronze-like colour of leaves. Here is an uh, image of a tomato leaf with chlor um, chlorine deficiency. Magnesium activi activates several, cell several enzymes in the citric acid cycle. You can see intravenous necrosis and small ne necrotic spots. It may occur in the younger or the older leaves as magnesium is mobile. This is an image of magnesium deficiency in a maple leaf. Sodium accumulation in Australian soils can be a common phenomenon. Sodium is required in C4 and CAM plants and it requires sodium mines for regenerating phosphophenol pyruvate. When sodium is deficient, you can get chlorosis and necrosis, and you can get failure to develop flowers. This is an image of sodium deficiency in the plant celery. Iron is an important component, component of enzymes in the transport of electrons, such as cytochromes. When iron is deficient, you can get intravenous chlorosis initially on younger leaves, you may observe it in veins and it may become chlorotic. The whole leaf may turn white. Low mobility due to precipitation in older leaves as insoluble complexes is something to look out for. Here we have a rose leaf that's been, uh, that's been subjected to severe iron deficiency. Zinc is a compound that's required by many en enzymes. Reduction in the inter internodal growth, small Distorted leaves with puckering. Some species may exhibit intravenous chlorosis with white necrotic spots. The image shows zinc deficiency in citrus. Copper is associated with the enzymes in the redox reactions. When copper is deficient, as in the image of barley, dark green leaves which contain necrotic spots can be observed. Leaves may be twisted and malformed. Leaf abscission in severe cases can be found. Nickel is required by the enzyme ure urease. When it's deficient, you see accumulation of urea in the leaf showing leaf tip necrosis. The image on the right hand top is nickel deficiency in birch leaves. Molybdium is involved in components of several enzymes, including nitrate reductase and nitrogenase. When deficient, it shows general necrosis between the veins and necrosis of the older leaves. It may fail to flower. Acidic soils in Australia may be deficient. The image on the right bottom is a deficiency of molybdenum in cucumber plants. All the slides today have given you a bit of an overview for what nutrient deficiency can look like in plants. One of the ways of being able to detect a nutrient deficiency is to actually sample the plant tissues and send them off for analysis.
This enables requirements for the mineral elements and you can look at the changes that are occurring during growth and development of your plants. Soil analysis is a method that, you, that we can use in order to determine the nutrient soil content. And this will give you an idea about how to manage your soils long term. Plant tissue analysis provides additional information and allows you to adjust within season nutrient deficiencies. Data from the ABS website, the Australian Government Bureau of Statistics, can give you an overview for 2009-2010 fertiliser use in Australia. It is a very large agricultural business in Australia and this reflects the importance to, um, the, to agriculture and the industry of its use. In this table you can not only see the breakdown of use in the different states, but also you can see how, what types of fertiliser are used. Urea is the most popular used. If you would like further information on uh, mineral nutrients, the FAO publication Fertiliser Use by Crops, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 make an excellent read. They can be obtained free of charge off the following internet web link. So why are, plant, are minerals so important to plant? Well, we've known for some time that there is an important relationship between yield and nutrient content of a plant tissue. You can break this down into three zones. The first zone is described as a deficiency zone. And this is, if your plants are growing in this zone, it means that they're not reaching their optimal from a yield perspective. The second zone is called the adequate zone. And this is where plants are able to grow to, um, to adequate uh, from a yield perspective. The third zone is a toxic zone and this is where um, the, too, too, much, too many nutrients have caused uh, deleterious effects to the growth and the yield. It is important to have an understanding of not only the deficiency zone, adequate zone and toxic zone, but also understand the economic components if you put too much zone, uh, nutrients on and you're in the adequate zone, then you could be wasting nutrients. If you don't put enough um, nutrients on and you're, you're wasting your economic potential by reducing your yield. So understanding these relationships is important. The process of adding fertilizers to the soil or directly to the plant is the process that enables fertigation and adequate nutrient levels to be provided. It is quite a complex and challenging area. The following flowchart gives you a breakdown of how nutrients can be supplied to plants in agriculture. They can be separated into two fundamental groups, the organic manures and the chemical fertilizers. Each of these groups have sub subdivisions and sub fertilizers and each one should be looked at and the species, the soil type, the growth, uh, growth stage, soil composition and plant tissue analysis should all also be considered when choosing which fertilizer to apply. Fertilizers and agriculture have been very much integrated into modern life. Without the ability to fertilise and without the ability to produce yields of such high tonnage, we would not be able to evolve as a human race as well as we have. It is important to understand that yields of most crops increase linearly with fertilisation. To meet the increased demand for food, annual consumption of primary mineral elements in fertiliser rose from 30 to 140 million tonnes from 1960 to 1990. And this does indeed reflect its importance in modern day agriculture. The availability of mineral nutrients for agriculture is an issue of food security. It is important to understand how nutrients are in the agroecological zone. Millennium Goals developed from MDGs, which is um, an organisation in the United States, identifies the role of nutrients in stopping poverty and world hunger and in obtaining environmental sustainability. 
The solutions that were proposed in this report was that increased agricultural productivity in the regions concerned would help to alleviate their poverty. The use of fertilisers may be beneficial or detrimental to the environment depending on how they are used. It is important to understand these relationships and get this right. In part one of this topic, Plant Nutrition Lecture 12, you were asked to read the recommended textbook, Taze and Zeiger Plant Physiology 5th edition, chapter 5 on plant mineral nutrition. Many of the aspects covered in this topic, in this reading, sorry, are relevant to the lecture here. Please understand the roles that plant nutrition play in growth, development and production. Understand the consequences to plant health if these compounds are not in adequate concentrations. And finally, after completing this lecture and the reading, you should have an understanding of the Association for Agriculture and Plant Nutrition. It is a very important input into plant production. This brings us to the end of part two.